to live an uncommon life, one needs to learn uncommon disciplines. Hey, this is Mark Devine. Welcome back to the Unbeatable Mind Podcast. Thanks so much for being here today. Appreciate your time. Today, I have another solo cast, and I'm reading chapters from the newly edited, updated book, Unbeatable Mind, which I'm colloquially calling the pandemic edition, even though it won't be called that. But I had a little time on my hands, so I um, started another edit of that book, which has been a pet project of mine, and it's turned out to be quite different, and I think you'll enjoy it. So I'm on chapter one, titled Win in Your Mind. Here we go. Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. Sun Tzu. A month before I tested for my green belt ranking, under Nakamura's watchful eye, I decided to take it to the next level by joining some senior students for deep training at the Zen Mountain Monastery in Woodstock, New York. The schedule would have me practicing the physical skills of karate alongside the mental skills of Zen. An hour of meditation at 5 a.m. was followed by two hours of karate training, which was repeated several times a day throughout the four-day retreat. At the first morning meditation session, I took my seat on the little bench, which was to take the pressure off our knees and allow us to keep our backs straight. I snuck a peek around. Most of the students I saw were resident monks or lay practitioners of the monastery. Imagine what a professional meditator would look like, and they were in that room. At that point in my meditation practice, I was still a raw beginner, and I wondered if they could sense the charlatan in their midst. Sitting in meditation with a group of seasoned veterans and a head monk really put the pressure on. There is a resonance effect in retreat settings where the intensity and depth of meditation of others rubs off on a beginner, leading to quicker and more positive results. But after 45 minutes of trying to sit with a ram straight spine and focus on my breathing, counting each inhale and exhale, I was mentally exhausted and my back hurt like hell. Why did this suck so much? It seemed harder than our Thursday evening Zen sits back at the dojo. I'd expected that the peace of the monastery and the singular focus would make it easier. Not a chance. The bliss I was seeking was elusive. Who would have thought that, a, that doing nothing could be so acutely painful and daunting? Perhaps I was searching too hard or for the wrong effect. And as a results-oriented athlete and business professional, I expected to be able to see some tangible benefit, such as bliss, joy, and total understanding of the meaning of life. I mean, why not, right? Try harder, I told myself. Don't look like a loser in front of these dedicated Zen people. Just concentrate on that spot in front of me. Don't give up. The instructions were to count to 10. Each breath cycle was a number. But if you noticed that your mind got a hold of a thought and ran off with it, then you were penalized by having to go back to zero. I felt like I'd stepped into meditation boot camp, replete with drill instructor and penalties for screwing up. I got to the count of two, but then realized that I was thinking about breakfast. Back to zero. Next time, I didn't get past one. Then I hit two again and was on my way, but realized I was celebrating which is thinking. Ugh. The next determined attempt, I made it to the count of three, but then had to admit to myself that though I was concentrating in the foreground, in the background of my mind, I was fantasizing about a girl I had met the previous weekend. I was splitting my attention and wondered how often I did that. I bet it was a lot. Well, that's why this training is important, I confessed. Yikes. Thinking about the quality of my meditation is thinking. Back to zero. That experience was a real eye-opener, and it was not my third eye that was opening. I could barely make it a few minutes before my mind, like a monkey frantically grasping for a banana, would race off in one direction or another, elaborating thoughts into complete manuscripts. I later called it concentration camp to a buddy. I read that the path to deeper mental strength would start with training my mind to concentrate on just one thing for long periods of time. But with such an active mind, it seemed impossible. Just sit and count your breath, instructed Dido, the head monk, like it was the easiest thing ever. When the mind wanders, simply, yeah, right, bring it back to the breath. Then the clincher, quote, don't beat yourself up either. Life's too short, he said with a chuckle. Oddly, 
Life had never moved slower for me. I was used to things being easy and was an expert at beating myself up when I didn't master something in 10 seconds. I had imagined that the meditation retreat would be as easy as stretching out in a hammock. Wrong again. Despite my clumsiness, I began to register a surprising change at that event. Even though I admitted to being a meditative failure, I noticed that the more I practiced, the better I felt. I was becoming more grounded and calmer. I considered that this type of internal mental work didn't require the aggressive goal orientation of my martial arts or sports training, nor the mindset that drove me in my work as a CPA. Maybe there was no there there. So I decided to stop goaling myself on the number of hours dedicated to practice and instead commit to just doing it daily. Between formal practice sessions, I would constantly remind myself to bring my awareness back to the breath. It made sense to me to turn it into a daily must-do, like eating well and exercising, with no expectation for gain. Even though I sucked, it worked its magic anyways. The inner stillness that sitting on that silly bench brought me was similar to the silence of nature that I had enjoyed in my youth. What a profound discovery. A major lesson I gained from that initial journey into meditation was that I could gain control over my mind, but only if I consistently practice. That meant daily striving for a concentrated state, which would often lead to moments of a complete cessation of active thinking. When I achieved that place of stillness, I could see that my awareness or witness was always there with or without thinking. So I was not my thoughts, but something much deeper. Amazing. Separating identity from thoughts and emotions is the main outcome of meditation practice. You develop the metacognitive capacity to observe thoughts in real time or to pause them while checking in with your witnessing self to choose what thoughts to have, when to have them, and what to do with them. That space that opened up between thinking and feeling and my witnessing awareness is where I found the magic of deep creativity and 20 times potential. As you head down this path, be patient and trust that the results will come with practice, but not the way you're used to seeing results. Also, expect the unexpected. The mental training snapped me out of my mistaken views about life, setting me on a path to become an elite warrior. Later on, as my 20-year Navy SEAL career unfolded, I sought to better understand the seeds that Zen had planted during those formative years in New York City. Operating as a SEAL, I found that during long patrols or numbingly cold dives, with just an intention and a few deep breaths, I could drop into the same concentrated state I had experienced on the bench. Hours would slip by as the calm focus and confidence of awareness overrode the negativity and bias of my thoughts. And when a crisis hit, rather than react negatively or try to one-dimensionally think a way through the problem, I used the intuition of awareness to sense my way through those critical moments. I observed how overthinking, analysis paralysis, and knee-jerk reactionary thinking had been responsible for injuries and even deaths of my teammates. I chose to surrender any doubt or thoughts of, quote, is this worth all the effort, end quote, and double down on my practice. And as time went on, I became more vividly aware of what was transpiring in and around me moment to moment. These experiences really motivated me to deepen my training and to seek other teachers. I took every opportunity to practice until it became a constant companion. This motivation for growth pushed me to seek answers to these questions. How could I deepen my intuition and spontaneous knowing further? Could I activate a flow state at will? Could I intentionally slow down time? Could I remain calm even in a firefight? How were skills such as deep breathing, concentration, visualization, positive internal dialogue, and mindfulness connected? What impact did these tools have for performance and goal accomplishment? How could I develop my creativity? And what were my limits? I would answer these questions and more through thousands of hours of personal practice, as well as later trial and error with SEAL trainees and other clients. I can say confidently that without my personal meditation practice, I would not have become a SEAL, been a successful leader, authored books, started multiple business ventures, or become a philanthropist. In no way would I have broken through the rutted mental and emotional patterns that had held me back and found the path of unbeatable mind. You know, this whole 
COVID-19 and economic lockdown and my crazy work schedule and my ridiculous training schedule has really started to wear me down lately. Uh, you know, I've got a ton of great practices to stay calm and rebalance. And in spite of them, I was feeling a little worn out. And I was talking to a friend about this and he turned me on to something that is a game changer. And no one likes feeling stressed out. And I bet you that you are feeling the same because this is our unprecedented times we're in. And we want to think it's, you know, we can just charge ahead and use all the skills that got us to where we were before. But Maybe we need to do something different. So he turned me on to something that helped him completely avoid or turn around from his burnout moment. And it wasn't any special vacation or rest or secret relaxation technique. It was a supplement. All he said he did was add a certain mineral into his diet based upon his doctor's recommendation. And that was to superdose magnesium, of all things. I didn't know this, but magnesium is the fourth most abundant mineral in the human body. It's responsible for 300 to 600 different biochemical reactions. So when your levels are low, you struggle with sleep, energy, low metabolism. You'll have more pain, more stress. Now, you will find magnesium in foods like black beans and nuts and avocados, spinach and more. But you've got a super dose if you're a hardworking, hard training individual. You can't get enough magnesium for what your body needs, not from the food the way it's produced these days. So we've got a supplement. Now, before you go and research magnesium supplements, know that most fail to help you beat stress for two reasons. One, they're synthetic, which means they're unnatural and not recognized by your body. And two, they're not full spectrum, which means they don't have all the forms that you need. There's seven of them. So what my buddy introduced me to was... What he thought and what I now think is the best magnesium, magnesium supplement out there. It's the most potent, complete, full spectrum formula that uh, has ever been created. It's called Magnesium Breakthrough. Magnesium Breakthrough is a complete formula that includes naturally derived forms of all seven forms of the supplemental magnesium. It doesn't contain any synthetic additives or preservatives. It's the most potent oral magnesium you'll ever find, period. Many notice a sense of calm and relaxation immediately as their nervous systems and stress levels are soothed. And then often they sleep better within the first week if it's used daily as instructed. Many people use it in the morning to help them stay calm and resilient throughout the day. Within three to five weeks, most who use it experience a level of peace and serenity that they haven't felt in a long time. That is cool. So I highly recommend trying Magnesium Breakthrough for at least 30 days. You test it out. See how it works on yourself. What have you got to lose? I've been using it for a few weeks now, and I feel great. So also, I'm going to give you 10% off because you're hearing it here on the Unbuild Mind podcast. If you go to their website with a landing page for Unbeatable and use the code UNBEATABLE10, you'll get 10% off. Their website is buyoptimizers.com slash unbeatable. We are. Hope you try it out. Talk to you soon. What is winning in the mind? SEALs operate at an elite level primarily because they discipline their minds to see mission success, both individually and as a team. This allows them to secure the win internally before they enter the fight. This is what I call winning in the mind before ending their battle. It's likely that you don't have time or interest to join a Zen monastery or spend 20 years as a SEAL in order to forge that level of mental toughness. Fortunately, you won't have to. You can trust that the skills I offer in this book will accelerate your growth faster than my own trial and error approach did. Thousands of successful special operators and other leaders that have put these skills into practice have put these skills into practice with terrific results. But you may wonder how to start a personal practice if your mind is like a runaway freight train. Sitting down and slowing down to train your mind can be a real challenge in our world. With great intentions, you give it a try, but are immediately frustrated by the busyness and randomness of your mental machinations. Attempts to settle the mind by trying to not think simply leads to more thinking and more frustration. As a teenager, I tried Transcendental Meditation, or TM, with my father. The mantra practice was recommended to him to help control his anxiety and anger. Sitting in a cozy chair, I tried like heck to focus on the mantra. After several seconds, 
My inner dialogue started chattering like a malcontents gossip session. Anything and everything came up. What's for dinner? Got to go mow the lawn. Wish I hadn't said that to Sally. Boy, I've got a ton of homework to do. What the heck am I doing this for anyways? This sucks. I don't have time for this. I'm out of here. You get the picture. Maybe it sounds familiar. TM was not going to work for me then because I wasn't ready to take my training seriously. Consolation prize was that my dad failed miserably too. We both quit after a few weeks. When I found Zen training, I was older, had a trusted mentor, and more patience. That practice showed me that the brain is hardwired to overthink and react negatively to perceived stressors. It takes dedicated training to break those patterns. The practice pushes back against the brain's very evolution and countless years of collective consciousness. Unfortunately, the outcome of not training the mind means identifying with thoughts and emotions while missing the real truth of your life, that you are a spiritual being having a momentary human experience for the purpose of evolution. And the thoughts you do have are mostly negative, are biased and influenced by the subconscious shadow elements of your ego's attachments. That is a destructive place to be as evidenced by what we see in the world around us. This is a critical problem which leads to much unnecessary pain and suffering. You will never find your calling nor find peace of mind and contentment if you identify with your thoughts and live as ego. The constant distractions of cravings, desires, attachments, repulsions, judgments, blaming, victimizing, shaming, guilting, and more leads to endless cycles of suffering and searching outside yourself for a cure. The soul is obscured behind the ego's wall of obsessive thinking and emotions, waiting patiently for your attention. As mentioned earlier, learning to take control over your thoughts and the ego's attachments is a starting point to living a fully autonomous life. As Viktor Frankl learned, true freedom is found within. The Zen teachers had that part right. The mental boot in the head that a good meditation practice brings overrides conditioned behavior, replacing it with a holistic, integrated approach to thinking rooted in your spiritual self or witness. This type of training can cause trepidation if you mistake it for a religious orientation or have the misperception that you will lose your sense of self. What would you become if you disassociated from all the ego's drives and thoughts? Would you be like a zombie devoid of any personality? That is not what happens at all. It's a mistake of certain meditation traditions to strip the personality out of the individual. You'll never actually stop thinking nor kill the ego. The ego is just a collection of ideas and beliefs about your identity and place in the world. It's no more real than the notion that time is real. Instead, you will learn to direct your thoughts more powerfully and to overcome the negative aspects of your personality to allow the innate positive qualities to shine. If your experience with meditation has been unpleasant so far, please know that you're not alone. Forget about the past and the failed efforts. Take this moment to formally and forever let go of the failures and give yourself a fresh start. Now is the only time that matters. Forging unbeatable mind mental skills for elite level performance demands practice. It is through the daily practice that you will finally gain access to the hidden mental power that works in partnership with your rational mind. Let's begin our training with some concentration drills. We'll break this training down Barney style, step by step. Barney was a Sesame Street character who, well, never mind. Embrace sacred silence. Sacred silence is the experience of incredible internal peace that accrues when you learn to connect to your witness and let go of your ego's cravings and outward reaching. It is intrinsically very motivating when you begin to experience sacred silence. For most Unbeatable Mind students, this is the turning point from trying this out to learn something to committing to practicing for life. In other words, Unbeatable Mind daily practice becomes a lifestyle. Most meditation practices come from Eastern cultures and are difficult for the contemporary Westerner to wrap their steel trap heads around. SEAL trainees' eyes would glaze over when I used terms from yoga or Japanese martial traditions. To solve this challenge, I took the foo out of the kung fu and developed my own tools and language for unbeatable minds suitable for the Western student. And my personal experience was that simple guided visualizations could help them develop and deepen a beginning meditation practice. The visualizations would focus and clear the mind quickly. 
The first one I introduce is called the fishbowl, which I will describe soon. I present a different one called Still Water Runs Deep in my book, The Way of the Seal, which has a similar effect. All the practices in this book have written and video descriptions in our Unbeatable Mind online course. The fishbowl is super effective because you're developing the skill of concentration, metacognition, and visualization all in one powerful practice. But if this approach doesn't work for you, then feel free to try the Zen way. Just sit and count each breath cycle trying to get the 10 while watching for any errant thoughts. If they arise, you note them, release them, but go back to zero to count breath again. I should take a moment to explain that the term meditation includes a broad array of practices such as breath work, concentration, mantra, contemplation, visualization, mindfulness, witnessing, and insight. Even time in nature or a long run can be considered meditation if done with the intention of witnessing versus thinking. Each practice will have a different effect on the brain and development of the mind, and I will be specific with what form we are using and why. Preparing for the work. Anytime we engage in an integrative physical, mental, emotional, intuitive, or spiritual training practice, we call it doing the work. Let me take a few moments to describe best, some best practices for preparing to do your work. First is the location. It's ideal to do your work in the same quiet, distraction-free place every time. This can be quite difficult if your lifestyle includes a lot of travel and a busy home. Like getting to know your gym or yoga studio, having a set place allows you to settle into the work much quicker to hold your attention better. Next, when you practice, try to be alone or at least let others know you're not to be distracted. This, of course, doesn't apply if you're meditating with a group. You will want to sit comfortably on a chair, a cushion, or kneel with your tail on a stool. You can Google Zazen bench for the stools. The postural best practices are to keep one, your knees below your hips. Two, your tailbone pointing toward the ground, hips slightly forward. Three, your spine straight. Four, your hands either folded in front of the belly or on the knees. Five, your chin slightly tucked and the crown of the head rising toward the ceiling. Six, your shoulders relaxed. And seven, your eyes ideally will be slightly open with a 45 degree downward gaze. Your gaze will be soft and unfocused. If that's too distracting, you can shut the eyes. I've meditated with both eyes open and shut and found it easier to learn with them shut. However, to progress to the highest stages of awareness and what is called the awakened state, you'll want to learn to meditate with the eyes open. Thus, there is a benefit to learning to do open-eyed meditation from the start. Consider trying different postures to avoid discomfort, which will further distract your mind. Standing is okay for brief periods of time if your back or knees begin to ache. At the start of each practice session, I find a preparatory drill called a, a body scan to be useful. This drill helps align and relax the body and to connect to the witnessing mind, which I'll discuss even more in a bit. Here's the body scan. This drill doubles as a sensitivity awareness exercise that can be done as a standalone, int, standalone drill for intuition development. It brings attention to each part of your body one at a time and then to the experience of the whole. As you move up your body, you will linger for a breath or two at each of the six subtle energy centers that run along the inside of the spine. These are known as chakras in the yoga developmental system. Here we go. Mentally scan your body from the feet to the top of the head and pause at each chakra to visualize the color and feel into the positive emotional energy that it represents. Here they are in order. One, the root chakra located at the base of your spine. The color is red. And the emotional energy is around survival, vitality, and feeling grounded. The second chakra is at the sacral, sacrum. It's located about three inches above the root in your lower abdomen, below the navel. The color is orange, and its emotional energy is around desire, healthy sexuality, and creativity. The third is the solar plexus, located just below the ribcage. The color is yellow. The emotional energy is feeling powerful, joyous, and taking action. Fourth is the heart chakra, located behind the heart in the center of the chest. The color is green. The emotional energy is of love and connection. Fifth is the throat chakra, located in the throat behind the Adam's apple. The color is blue. 
The emotional energy is clarity, attentiveness, and having a voice. The six is the brow or third eye chakra in the center of your brow, but a couple inches behind it. The color is indigo. The emotional energy is wisdom, insight, and spiritual knowingness. And seventh is the crown chakra located at the top of the skull or slightly above. The color is violet. The spiritual energy is truth and integration. So when you get done with that drill, now expand your awareness to your entire being and get a felt sense for your entire body, mind, spirit. Then expand that out a few feet further in all directions to feel an interaction with the space around you. Try to sense the energy around you and inside of you and to feel connected to it. If your mind wanders during this phase, don't sweat it. Just bring it back to feel the body in the space around you. This drill may seem esoteric if these practices are new to you, but trust me, it will have a profound impact over time. Now let's get into the fishbowl visualization. The fishbowl. Now you're ready to clear your mind and develop concentration power using the fishbowl technique. In your mind's eye, imagine your skull as a fishbowl, and your thoughts are the cloudy, murky water, which may not be too far from the truth. Your breathing is the filter. Each deep breath you take in and out is a cleansing breath that begins to clear the murky water, i.e. your thoughts, of your mind. You begin to sense the water of your mind getting cleaner and clearer as you breathe. After 10 breaths, it is mostly clean. After 20, it is as pure as a natural spring on a sunny day. As you see and sense the clarity of your mind through that clear fishbowl, you can relate it to the state of metacognition where you are witnessing your mind in a stable state with the only thought energy being the visualization that you are holding. In this state, your mind is unspoiled by random thinking or elaborate stories, and you can maintain that state for as long as you like. If you start thinking again, it is akin to your fishbowl getting dirty, so you simply recommit to cleaning it. This drill is a great concentration practice in and of, in itself, or it can be used to prepare for box breathing or other meditation session. In that capacity, simply drop the visualization after 20 breath cycles or so and get into the box breathing or other practice. The witness. Have you noticed that when you get stuck in your head, you can slide into negativity really quickly? With our obsessive thinking, we can judge others, get emotionally attached to our, our opinions, and are often impressed with our own brilliance and can shut others down and out. Negative thought loops make us lousy teammates and will sabotage our own success. Negativity and its allies of fear, anger, anxiety, depression, guilt, shame, apathy, egoic pride, perfectionism, righteousness, judgmentalism, and narcissism are typically masked over with incessant talking, eating, drinking, smoking, and busyness. We remain so distracted that we don't even notice how all that negativity is ruling and ruining our minds. Thus, we continue to experience it as, quote, normal and project it onto the outside world. All that negativity destroys performance and precludes true success and happiness in life. Why is it so easy and natural for us to be negative? It turns out that for survival's sake, our brain is wired with a bias for ne negativity. It has five times as many negative thoughts as positive ones because it needs to act on life-threatening influences daily. Therefore, the brain has been programmed epigenetically and through social conditioning to be pessimistic, so it can react immediately to threats. Unfortunately, many things are deemed to be a threat, which really are not. The amygdala immediately deploys the powerful sympathetic nervous system's army to fight that perceived threat, even if it's a non-threatening event. That's why we get buffeted by the wild negative punch of our nervous system as it overrides rationality to survive that email attack. <laughs> we will get more into how the brain and the mind cooperate in a later chapter. That negativity bias has been validated through multiple studies, but it isn't new knowledge. The image on the cover of this book is a nod to our wise Native American elders who recognize the truth. They taught that the wolf of fear resides in our brain and is ready to pounce the slightest sign of danger. But there is an antidote. You can learn to connect to a deeper spiritual strength, which I call your witness, and then feed the courage wolf who resides in your heart. 
Hey folks, I want to bring your attention to a product developed by a Navy SEAL friend of mine who was a doctor. Uh, first he was a SEAL, then he became a doctor, and then he went back and worked with the SEALs. His name is Doc Parsley. Some of you might have heard of him by now. We call him the sleep doc. All these SEALs were starting to come to him and, and you know, with these symptoms that looked like adrenal fatigue. And so he started treating adrenal fatigue and realized that the common denominator with all these guys that they weren't sleeping. It's pretty Big problem in military spec ops with the pace of operations and combat. And these guys were just all out of whack. Cortisol was racing their body. Their hormones were depleted. and dep You know, they had the essentially the, the testosterone level of 13-year-old girls is the way he jokes about it. They had a big problem. And what he found is that they were working out like madmen, but they're putting on weight. Their, you know, cognitive level was like they were drunk. Anyways, they were, they had this perception that they could perform, but they just couldn't perform anymore. And it was a real problem. So he identified that the common denominator was lack of sleep. So even an hour of not enough sleep a night over the course of a, of a year is going to lead to 14 pounds of weight gain and could degrade your performance by up to 30%. Throws your testosterone, your growth hormones, in, in, insulin sensitivity all out of whack. And it's going to create emotional uh, instability, decision-making um, challenges, impulse uh, control challenges, and decrease your willpower. Basically, your prefrontal cortex is compromised. So what he did is he, he went around and he, and, he, and he said, go buy this, buy this, buy this, and then you know start taking it and it worked. And so they said, well, this is a pain in the neck to buy all this. Can you, can you put it all together into one thing? And so that became Doc Parsley's sleep remedy. I tried this recently at our Unbeal Mind Summit and it worked really, really well. I, I kid you not. Like I took it and I fell asleep within 20 minutes and uh, I didn't have any grogginess when I woke up. I thought it was great stuff. So um, I told him I wanted to uh, let my folks know about it, let you know people who are listening to this podcast know about it. And he offered everyone a 10% off. So if you want to try Doc Parsley's Sleep Re Remedy, uh, which is essentially a, it's just a supplement. It's a nutritional supplement. It's all natural stuff, which creates a normal cascade of the physiological things that are supposed to happen when um, you're going to go to sleep. But a lot of us don't have that cascade or don't have that stuff happening anymore because of our lifestyle. So this will kind of stimulate um, proper, you know, preparation for sleep and, and, the, and the sleep cycles. Um, he has an unlimited, no questions asked, money back guarantee. Um, you can't beat that. So go to docparsley.com, D-O-C-P-A-R-S-L-E-Y.com and use the code unbeatablemind, all one word, all, all one word, unbeatablemind when you check out to get 10% off. And uh, highly recommend it. Hoo ya. Have you ever been knee deep in an argument when you suddenly had the experience of separating from the dialogue and watching the absurdity of what you and the other person were saying? You may have broken out laughing as you instantaneously shifted from identifying with the thoughts and words spewing out of your mouth to your metacognitive witnessing mind. These are important moments to pay attention to. They teach us that we are not our thoughts and stories, and yet how we can easily get wrapped up in them. When we're trapped in the story, we're not connected to our true self, which is expansive and whole. With unbeatable mind practice, you will tame your ego and firmly establish your mind in this metacognitive witnessing state. Over time, you'll leave behind the negative condition thoughts, behaviors, and reactivity altogether. It sounds simple, and in a sense it is, but it takes a lot of practice to incrementally gain distance from your thoughts and choose whether to continue them, respond in a different manner, or seize that thought stream altogether. The more you connect with your witness through practice, the more you will stabilize that point of view. This creates a sense of internal control and a positive attitude as you are released from the shackles of negativity. It's time to take control back from that negative ego. The mind's capacity to witness has always been there, but to connect to it, you first have to slow down and develop the concentration power to pause the rampant content to focus just on just one thing. Then you can open up space between the thoughts and the witness. The witness will then point away from negative conditioning and toward your innately positive nature. The Zen tradition talks about polishing the mirror to explain this phenomenon. Imagine your ego to be like a mirror of your mind. Negativity, false stories, fear, these things cloud the mirror, making it difficult to see yourself 
and reality with accuracy. As you practice connecting with your witness, you're polishing that mirror by actively training the skill to see clearly. You're getting in touch with the positive aspects of your ego instead of letting the negative rule. You're enacting a new phase of evolution toward your fullest human expression, away from the reactionary nature of your hard-scrabbled past. When you still your mind and connect to your witness, it may be surprising to recognize how habitually you harbor those negative weak thoughts. Where do they come from? Well, as mentioned earlier, they are planted in your brain through a variety of mechanisms which don't really matter anymore. What matters is that you can eradicate the addiction to them through practice. That's the powerful gift of the witness. You have a choice to change your thoughts immediately. You will come to rely on your witness during conversations and eventually during any and all actions to detect patterns of negative conditioning that that resurface. Awareness of the negative thought stimulus will softly remind you to redirect the mind toward more positive and productive thoughts. When I went through SEAL BUDS training, I was rock steady as a result of my concentration training with Zen, but I was not immune to the twin demons of negative thoughts and feelings. When I checked into class 170, my nerves were sizzling. I could feel the adrenaline pulse through my arteries. The magnitude of the larger-than-life instructors flared my imagination. They had a superhuman quality, and the students were like freaked-out carpenter ants frantically trying not to be crushed. My class had 184 other trainees and the stream of negative thoughts was expressed in the anxiety riddling their faces and negative schoolyard chatter. I was picking up a lot of it myself. I sensed the tension in my stomach as fear and dread settle into the class. I needed to constantly talk to myself positively as I had learned in my Zen meditation. Quote, I've got this easy day. I've trained hard. I've made it this far. Many have gone before me and made it. If they did it, so can I. Quitting is not an option. They'll have to drag me out of here in a body bag, end quote. Positive self-talk like that became my constant internal companion. Whenever I said those words internally, I felt doubt and fear melt away, and the firepower of courage replace it. I was using the technique of witnessing the flow of content of my thoughts and feelings, and then when negative thoughts began to seep in, I took action to redirect to positive thoughts. I was intentionally tuning to a positive frequency. I learned what a crucial skill this is for optimal performance, especially when under pressure. Obliterate negativity bias. You now know how much your mind is charged through culture, collective unconscious, parental influence, and life experiences to be negative and fearful. And you know that internal dialogue and beliefs primed by those overt and subtle negative forces will adversely impact your behavior, patterns, and performance. Further, you learn that the very nature of the brain is to constantly scan for threats and to react to them immediately with fight, flight, or freezing, whether you want to or not. Therefore, I can't stress enough how imperative it is that you train your mind to remain positive. A positive mind will also help your teammates be more positive and will set the conditions for you to attract the right teammates to help you accomplish your goals. Through daily practice, we can feed the courage wolf and cause negative energy to atrophy and then disappear altogether. I found the work of the late Dr. David Hawkins to be particularly insightful in this area of negative and positive energy. His seminal work, Power vs. Force, maps consciousness through muscle testing of truth, kinesiology, from the lowest to the highest with associated feelings and behaviors at each level. Dr. Hawkins' work showed that when we act below the level of courage and integrity, we're in a negative state of consciousness. And 85% of humanity operates below courage, which means that most of humanity is negative. Through unbeatable mind, we'll condition ourselves to, quote, feed the courage wolf, end quote, daily, to remain at courage and move quickly to the higher stages of consciousness above that, such as optimism, acceptance, gratitude, and universal love. Dr. Hawkins' positive map is this courage, trust, optimism, forgiveness, acceptance, reverence and love, joy, serenity, peace and bliss. Just as positive thoughts and energy attract positive people and circumstances, so do negative attitudes attract negative energy. If allowed to dominate, the negative energies will drain life force and lead to disease and suffering. The relentless drumbeat of negativity from, news, from the news media 
spurs more negative self-talk, reinforcing the problem. Hawkins' negative stages of consciousness are, from highest to lowest, pride and scorn, anger and hate, desire and craving, anxiety, grief or regret, apathy or despair, guilt or blame, and shame and humiliation. Using the witness process in conjunction with this map provides an unparalleled tool for eradicating negative emotional energies and replacing with positivity. You'll practice by maintaining connection to your witnessing mind to keep space between your thoughts and emotions. This allows you to avoid conditioned reactionary behavior from the negative energies. As you witness negative energies arise as thoughts or emotions, you'll interdict them to cancel the negative pattern and then redirect the mind toward the positive energy of courage. Once you are at courage, you can work on trusting, forgiving, and accepting reality for what it is. The interdiction is done with an internally delivered statement that will interrupt the negative thought. Once the negative thought pattern has been successfully interdicted, you'll maintain the new positive energy with a mantra, such as my go-to at Bud's. Looking good, feeling good, ought to be in Hollywood. We'll take a deeper look at this in a moment with the WIRM or W-I-R-M tool. But before that, the graphic that I have in the book demonstrates how to interdict and overcome the negativity loop that our untrained brains get stuck in. That loop has a false limiting belief leading to a weak self-concept that we interdict and redirect with positive self-talk, which leads to a positive emotion, which leads to a positive self-talk and a positive belief system, interdicting the negative loop. Now that we're taking this discussion of positive focus to the next level, let me mention that our bodies must get into the morale officer role as well. A mantra should be supported with a powerful posture, saying, I've got this easy day while slouched in a negative position is self-defeating. Your subconscious mind will feel the weak position and override the positive statement. It's better to stack the deck in your favor by combining a powerful internal mantra with a powerful body position. When I sensed the fear wolf nipping at seal fit trainees during a grueling workout, I would shout a powerful mantra and assume a posture that projected strength. The athletes would quickly join in as their attitudes and body language changed, as if jolted by a bolt of positrons. Soon, they would be smiling as they left the suffering behind. In team training or work settings, a good dose of humor will also help you in the role of a morale officer and get the team to feed their courage wolves. Feed courage with WIRM worm. We've seen how badly negativity erodes performance, so it's imperative to retrain underlying negative patterns and then maneuver from witnessing the negative thoughts to starving them into oblivion. Only then can we start to habituate positive courage-building thoughts. As the native elders might say with a vivid metaphorical punch, you need to starve the fear wolf to feed the courage wolf. The unbeatable mind tool of positive attention control to achieve this is called the worm, or W-I-R-M. Here's the summary. W is witness the negativity loop thought loop. The I is to interdict that negativity loop with a powerful interdiction statement, or alternately, you can visualize blowing it up. Three, the R is to redirect your mind to a new positive thought stream with positive self-talk and imagery, focused on something productive for your current goal. And four, the M is to maintain your new mental state with concentration power and a mantra. Mantra. Interdiction statements are words that shock your monkey mind back into control. Words like, not now, or stop that work well. And you can link them to another statement to add blast to them, such as, I've got this, piece of cake, step it up, Mark, or my favorite, feed the courage wolf. You will want to develop a power statement, one with some shock force to it, that resonates with you. Then practice using it daily. Practicing power interdiction statements then until they become second nature will, over time, place the interdiction process on autopilot. Juiced up power statements explode negative mental chatter and allow your mind to still itself and await its next set of instructions. Power statements temporarily interdict negative thoughts, but they don't ensure that those thoughts will stay away forever. Negativity will likely return unless you redirect your mind to a new positive thought pattern. Essentially, you must have a contingency plan to prevent backslide. 
I would see this with SealFit trainees all the time. When I noted a student going negative, my staff and I would do an interdiction for him or her. Hey, what wolf are you feeding, Joe? Time to feed the courage wolf. Let's go. The interdiction temporarily stops the student in his or her tracks as they note the negative state and the degradation of performance caused by it. The student has a moment of witnessing and a choice for a more positive direction. But if they lack a solid redirect strategy, their mind will revert back to the negative rut. The secret for a successful redirect is to inject a new positive thought pattern into your stilled mind that aligns with your immediate goal. You infuse the new thoughts with positive imagery and feelings, and you'll keep your mind focused on the new internal dialogue, imagery, and feelings until you're well into positive terrain. This requires that we create and practice a mantra. The mantra is a short verse, rhyme, or saying that's positively charged and has a strong meaning to it. You play it like background music. The mantra keeps negativity at bay by engaging your conscious mind in its positive words, images, feelings, and meaning. I must reiterate that these coded messages must be charged with meaning beyond their simple words. For example, quote, day by day in every way I'm getting better and better was first taught by the French doctor Emile Cuyet. He was able to heal his patients by having them change negative thinking and emotional states. They shifted to positive states by saying and believing that one mantra, and they healed physical ailments in the process. With practice, your mantra will run in the background of your mind with little or no prodding. It won't prevent you from using your rational mind for problem solving. Rather, it's like a gatekeeper for your witness, ever present to ward off negativity. Your mind remains under, under control and unfettered by thoughts or beliefs that sap your energy and degrade your performance. When habituated, the four-step worm process, WIRM process, is done in an instant. It also works well to focus a team that's getting down. As an example, during SILFA training, I would find it necessary to shout a verbal interdiction followed by verbal redirect instructions when I witnessed the whole team suffering from a defeatist attitude. Hooya, team, we got this. Focus on the next round. See it happening. Let's crush this. Instructions to this effect shook the team out of their slump and got them focused in a positive direction. Combined with regular meditative work, you should experience immediate results with this powerful attention and attitude control tool. However, please don't be discouraged if you feel like it's taking too much time for things to shift to you. Like all of the practices, you will make progress just by paying attention to the vital skill. The point is to create a ritualistic practice, not just to read about it and be inspired by it. I recommend you start with a body scan, fishbowl, and box breathing for a few months before implementing the four-step worm tool. This will set the stage for SEAL-style mental toughness. In the next chapter, we'll set about using this newfound positive focusing skills to transform your vision for the future. Start by asking and answering the most important questions. What is your why and where are you headed once you understand it? What is it that you want out of your brief time here and how do you want to be remembered? As you develop witnessing and focusing skills, if you're heading in the wrong direction, you might just get to the wrong destination even faster. And then what? More suffering. So let's avoid that. That's the end of chapter one. So thanks for listening, folks. Uh, Next solo cast, get into chapter two, which is titled Design Your Destiny. Hope you found this valuable and I um, appreciate you listening to the Unveil Mind podcast. And I'll see you soon. Ooh, yeah. Divine out.